Hello and assalamu alaikum everyone. I am Kashif Kamran and today I am discussing with you all the AA, the F8 paper exam tips for September 23 exams. The AA exams are just three weeks away and this is an ideal time that you should all sit down and devise a careful exam strategy to excel in the upcoming exam. Now the session today would deeply look inside the section A and B of the paper and I'll try to provide you the guidance which can benefit you in devising an exam strategy. Let's start on with this exam tips session. Now first of all with exams just three weeks away it is very important that you all refine the resources. Uh, this is a time that the resources should be refined down the resources should be brought down to a minimum level because in this last three weeks, you need to focus on something which is core, something which is essential and something which is important. Now, what are the key AA resources which should be utilized at this point in time? Let's, let's investigate them. The past papers, uh, the one available on the practice platform and I'll just be showing you that the examiner reports and the technical articles to me these are the three most critical resources which should be with you for the next three weeks because these three resources will will give you the right dimension ahead of your September 23 exams and will give you the right exam rigor ahead of your September 23 exams. Let's have a deep look on each of the three elements you can see on my presentation. Let's first start with the past exam papers on the practice platform. If you go to the practice platform, which you can now see on your screen and you scroll down and you go to the AA paper, the audit and assurance paper, and you go to the past exam library. In the past exam library, you can see six papers and this should be your first priority. And the six papers are from December 2020 exams up to the latest one, which is March, June 23. This six papers are must, are essential and you need to do them very carefully and very properly. You need to do each and every question, each and every part. You should properly read them, properly solve them, and then you can reconcile your points with the examiner points. Again, I'm saying not reconciling your answer with the examiner answer, but reconciling the point with the examiner point because the way you develop a point and the examiner develop a point, there is a big difference. But at least if 50% of your points reconciled with examiner points that's good but again it's not about reconciling the answer it's about reconciling the point you picked for example if you picked a risk and that risk is in the examiner answer that's good but the way examiner will explain and you will explain will be big diff will be a big difference so don't don't go down with reconciling the answer reconciling the points uh, if you struggle somewhere you can see the examiner answer as a source of guidance you can learn something from the examiner answer but again something you're learning from the examiner answer is the way the examiner develops a point not the length of the point so examiner answers can be a source of learning but you need to approach them with a cautious approach because a lot of time what students see from examiner answer is the length of the answer, which is something wrong. You should see how the examiner writes a, writes a point, how he develops a point, or if you don't know a certain syllabus area, and in that context too, examiner answers can be a good source of learning for future exams. So try to focus on the six papers, which you can see right in front of your screen under the past exam library. Then the ACCA will be publishing the mock exam for September 23, which will be uh, available ideally in a day and two from now. And mostly the mock exam is available under the practice exams. So you can already see it's available now. The AA pre-September 23 mock. So I'm doing this session on the 15th of August and this mock is there available. So you will need to do the AAA pre-September 23 mock. If you want to add on to your practice, 
you can do the practice exam one and two as well. So that will give you six past papers, which I've shown you above from December 2020 to March 23, March, June 23, six and one mock seven and two practice exams, one and two. So that is a total of nine papers you are doing. And this is maximum. You're not going behind this. This is sufficient, appropriate audit practice you're doing for your upcoming exams. And this is quality practice. Uh, going down into kits, uh, doing kits one time, two time, which most of the students do it. I, I don't like that approach at all because it's about the quality. It's not about the quantity, which will help you pass the AA exams. So please try to focus on the six practice exams, the sorry, six uh, past exam libraries. And then you have two practice exams and one mock exam for September 23, which you should be doing in. So that's one thing which we were discussing in the key resources, past exam papers on practice platform. And in total, those past exam papers on practice platform have come to nine. And you know the breakup of nine now, right? Which includes the mock exam as well. Then the next thing is examiner reports. Examiner reports is such an important source of learning because they give you the criticism, they give you the strength and weaknesses uh, into the stronger students and the weaker students. You can learn a lot from examiner reports. Uh, examiner report tells you what the student did good and bad even give you examples of uh, how to write risk, how to write procedure, or how to write an implication for an audit report. You can learn so much from the examiner report. And honestly, uh, if you review three latest examiner reports, three latest examiner reports, you will learn so much. You will learn uh, the do's and don'ts, and that can really be implemented in your real exam. So if you can just keep a red pen and a green pen with you and you download the report and you read through it, wherever you find something being criticized, something the examiner don't want you to do, just underline that in red. And something where the examiner is encouraging something, giving you an, a piece of advice or telling you something about the stronger student, underline that in green. Once you read the whole report and you have the red and the green underlining, that can really help you ensure that you are avoiding the reds, you're implementing the greens, and that will really improve your prospects of passing the upcoming exams. So try to invest in three latest examiner reports. If not more than that, then three is a good number. Now, just let me show you those examiner reports, which is a critical resource published by ACCA. You go to the examiner reports for AA, and in the exam reports, the three latest ones are March, June 23. So once you have attempted the March, June 23 paper on the practice platform, then read the exam report. Then there is a September, December 22 exam report. So once you've done the September, December 22 ex uh, question paper, then read the exam report. And then there is a March, June 22. First do the paper, first solve the paper, and then read the examiner report because you can identify what you did wrong in your answer. So if you want to investigate the, the wrong aspects in your answer, uh, you should read the examiner report after you have attempted the answer of the respective paper. And in that way, you can self evaluate yourself where you are standing three weeks before the exam date and you still have a chance to improve it. Because if you found something wrong in your answer, as per the examiner report, you can improve on that. And that is the that is the beauty of the examiner report. That is the beauty of this resource, which ACCA has published, giving us the mindset of the examiner. And if you come close to the mindset of the examiner, you will pass the AA paper. So the only resource which brings you close to the mindset of the examiner, what the examining team is looking for in your answer to reward you marks is in the examiner report. So it's better to read them. And I'm recommending at least the three of them, the latest one, March, June 23, September, December 22, and March, June 22, please ensure you read them. But again, after attempting the past paper of the respective exam settings. So this will add immensely to your prospects of passing the AA paper, the examiner report. Then you come down to the last element, knowledge. 
technical articles. We know technical articles are so important to build up your knowledge and the knowledge which is coming right from the examiner perspective, not, not Kaplan, not BPP, right from examiner perspective. What is going in the mindset of the examiner when he's thinking about a topic from an examination point of view? Because in almost every technical article, the examining team also tells you how this will be examined. And in almost every article, the examining team try to solve a short question to tell you how a question will come and how would you be solving it. So you're not just learning the technical side of it. You're also learning how it will be examined in the uh, in the actual exam. So you're getting the double benefit, which is very, very important at this point in time when your exams are three weeks away. Just let's have a look at the technical articles available. Now, the technical articles have been divided into the syllabus areas, making your life easier. Syllabus area A, B, C, D, E. So you, you can go areas, area by area. In the syllabus area A, there is just one article, laws and regulations. You should read it out. You should know the auditor responsibility for laws and regulation, the management responsibility for laws and regulation, and what steps the auditor should undertake if there is a non-compliance with laws and regulations. And again, examiner, examining team will give you the exam perspective of how this question will come in exam paper. Then in the syllabus area B, which is the more important syllabus area, you have risk and understanding the entity. And we know risk is a very, uh, very foremost question in section B of the paper, risk and audit responses. Uh, examining team expects knowledge from you in terms of planning the audit or what sort of matters you should consider when you're planning the audit. So a lot of that knowledge can come from these articles in section uh, B of this uh, technical articles, risk and understanding the entity, audit risk. We know how critical audit risk is. Again, this article will give you examples of how you write an answer on audit risk, uh, how you should pick up an audit risk from a case study. So these are not just technical articles. They're also giving you the exam dimensions. Uh, ISA 330, uh, responses to assess risk, because we know the question on risk in AA is not just audit risk, it's also the response on risk. So you can learn a lot from that. Audit working papers, we know knowledge questions to come on audit working papers. You should have a good knowledge of that. And the tricky topic video, audit risk and planning. So ACC has also uploaded a video on a tricky topic, audit risk and planning. So if you want to refine yourself further into the topic of audit risk, there is a video given by one of the tutor, expert tutor, Aaron Morton, and he looks into this tricky topic, audit risk and planning. So a lot of benefits is there ahead of three in the time you're left with. So you can utilize this time reading the articles, learning the exam approach, exam dimension, and then there are some videos available as well, which can really add value to your upcoming exam setting. Then the syllabus area C, internal controls, we know how important that is from a examination point of view, particularly the syllabus area B. Audit of wages, how you do the audit of wages, uh, we know payroll comes a lot of time in terms of weaknesses, deficiencies, test of control. So you can learn a lot of that from this article audit on wages. Specific aspects of computer-based auditing. Uh, we know the aspect of computer, computer controls, the knowledge about computer controls, the application controls, the processing controls, the input controls. You can learn a lot from that article and auditing in a computer-based environment. So again, uh, these articles will refine you this article will help you revise your knowledge around these critical areas. And the better thing is, again, the exam perspective. Every article will tell you how this could be examined. So that opens your mindset, how you should be approaching your upcoming AA exam. So every article is not just giving you the technical knowledge, but it's also ensuring it's giving you the exam perspective and you're reading through the mindset of the examiner because these articles are written by the examiner. An examiner is the one who will set the paper so you can understand how critical is it to read them over the book. Then you go down into the syllabus area D, audit evidence, audit of assertions, knowing the meanings of assertions, knowing the examples of assertions. They help you a lot in section A. We know a lot of multi, um, lot of objective test questions comes on uh, assertions, right? So in order to be good in that area, you need to read through this article. Then audit sampling. We know a lot of knowledge-based questions comes on audit sampling in section A, sometime in B, uh, types of samplings, 
and knowing the differentiation between statistical and non-statistical sampling, again, learning from them. And again, there is a video here, tricky topic video audit procedures. We know a lot of times students struggles writing substantive procedures. So again, a video has been uploaded by ACCA on that perspective as well. And finally, the area of review and reporting the auditor report, knowing the basics of audit report, knowing uh, the opinions, knowing the uh, emphasis of a meta paragraph, knowing the CAM, knowing MURGC, knowing different elements of audit report and when to use them rightly. So you need the right knowledge right from this article. Going concern, we know that is such an important area in section B. Lo lots of time the question comes on going concern. So you, you need to know the going concern indicators. You need to know the implication of going concern on the audit report. And so is the case with subsequent events. So this is the articles. Then multiple area articles. Uh, using the work of internal auditors, again, a knowledge area, how how would you ensure you use the work of internal auditor, knowing the criteria of independence, experience, competence, etc. And then the analytical procedures, we know uh, a lot of time the knowledge comes on analytical procedures, asking you explain the importance of analytical procedure in audit planning, or we know the ratio analysis is also part of the audit risk question as well. So. If you go through these articles and you watch uh, videos given uh, to you in the areas of risk and procedure, it can refine you three weeks ahead of your exam. See the number of articles, two, three, four, five, leaving aside the videos, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 15 articles, 21 days, one article a day, you're done. Read article one a day and just absorb it and see the, how big impact you will get on the day of exam. 15 articles, and there are two videos, 17, 21 days, still manageable, still doable. One article a day or one video a day, and you're done with it. But don't ignore it. You will realize how different uh, perspective you will have about the question that will come in your exam or how the topic will be examined in your exam after you read through these articles. And I, as a tutor, I always encourage students to read through the articles rather than reading through the books because that wastes a lot of time for, on, in, in terms of my feedback. So three things now done through. We have 15 articles to read through. We have three latest examiner reports to read through. We have past papers, nine of them to go through, which includes the mock exam and the practice exams as well. So these are key resources. And this is where refinement will come in. This is where you're refining yourself to the core resources, which not just uh, add value, but also improve prospects of you passing the upcoming exams. So I hope you will utilize them when you sit down after watching this video and try to devise your timetable ahead of your upcoming exams. Now, moving forward and moving forward to the overall time management we have in the AA paper. Now, we know in the AA paper, you have a total of 195 minutes. You have a section A and a section B. Both contribute significantly to you passing and failing the paper. For section A, uh, my uh, recommended time is 58 minutes. And for the section B, it's 137 minutes. Now, we know in the section A, you have three OT cases, and each OT case has five OT questions. And in the section B, you have three or uh, three constructed response questions, 30, 20, 20. So you need to bifurcate this 137 minutes into three of them and the 58 minutes into three OT cases as well. So we'll see that split once we move into section A and B respectively. But this is the overall time management you have for A and for B. So roughly one hour you have for section A and a slightly over two hours you have for section B. Okay, now let's investigate section A, which is 30% of the paper and what you need to know about it in terms of preparation and how can you excel in this area. Now the time management you have for section A is 19 minutes per OT case. You have three OT cases, right? And you have a total of 58 minutes. So allocate roughly 20 minutes to one OT case and you're reading through the OT case and you're looking at the five OT questions, one, two, three, four, five, and taking in the right answer. Then the next and the next. So that means you're not in a hurry, right? Uh, plenty of time 
20 minutes psychologically per OT case where you can just read through the case study in like five minutes and it left with like 15 minutes to read through the five OT questions, one, two, three, four, five and choosing the right answer. That means 15 minutes divided by five, three minutes per OT question. That's a lot. Choosing the best answer, not in a hurry, not in a hurry, because a lot of time the students are in so hurry that they try wrapping up the section in like 25 minutes then realizing they're not scoring much from section A and probably section A is becoming a reason of their failure. Try to choose the right answer. Three minutes per OT question. Utilize that. Now, an overview of the section A. 30% of the total paper. Total time is 58 minutes and you're dividing that by 19 minutes per OT, OT case. Each OT case with five questions should be given 19 minutes. There is a reading and planning time and then there is a time to choose the right answer. Yeah. Don't be in a hurry, which most of the time students are in section A and that becomes a reason of failing the double A paper. Try to choose the right answer. Think three minutes per OT question. Think you might get close to taking the right answer. Choose the right answer carefully. Practice recent attempts on section A, including the June 23 mock and the examiner report for AA as it contains the section A OT questions. Now this will become the September 23 mock. So including the September 23 mock and examiner report uh, as they are key source for practicing the section A. I'll, I'll just tell you how to go down with section A. Uh, what is the best source of revising the section A? And that this is it. Examiner reports, a key source for Section A. All examiner reports available on ACCA website have, have Section A MCQs, which you can do to Excel. March 23, examiner report is the latest one. Start from here and work backwards. Let, let me show you that. Just showing you the examiner reports, right? See. These are exam reports. March, June 23 is the latest one and go in the inverse order. December 22, June 22, December 21, and you go backwards. Finish off all the exam reports. In every exam report, you get a section A commentary. Uh, you, get, you get an OT case in every exam report. An examiner will give you the right answer and the reason of that. First, look at the OT case in the exam report. Try to solve it yourself and then see the examiner answer. And the, and the reason of that being the right answer. You can learn from it. So if you do all these exam reports for section A only, you will get the right temperament for OT cases. And you can learn a lot because yes, there is a repetition and you might be lucky enough if a certain OT case or an OT question gets repeated, but doing them all is good for your section A preparation. So please ensure you do uh, all these exam reports, seven of them, and you get hold of your section A um, structure. And then you have to read the articles as well, right? I've recommended you lots of articles where some of the articles were on Section A areas, which can really be beneficial for you. So that's that's the key resource for Section A. And that's how you can improve your prospects. Utilizing the time, not, not, be, not be in a hurry. You have good enough time for Section A, almost 20 minutes per OT case, and you can do them in, in excellent form. Just ensure you give the proper time to them, right? And practice of the uh, Section A from the examiner report would really add value. Now, moving towards the key section, which is Section B of the paper. Section B, 70% of the paper, and to me, the most critical one, because uh, if you do this in an excellent manner, your chances of passing improves a lot. Let's see what you need to do for section B to Excel. Now we had the time management for section B, which was ideally 138 minutes, slightly over two hours. And this is how you can break them down into question one, two, and three, 30 marks, 20, and 20. You can see the time you have the red, red is the total time, 40, the, sorry, the, the 59 is the total time in blue for question number one, 39 is the total time for the question number two, and 39 is the total time for the question number three. So the blue is donating the total time you have for each question. Now within the 59 minutes, 
how much time you have to read and plan and to write. So 15 minutes is the time you have for reading and planning in orange. For the question number two, you have 10 minutes of reading and planning time. And again, for question three, you have 10 minutes of reading and planning time. So what is in red is the writing time. 44 minutes you have to write. And then in the question two and three, you have 29 minutes each to write. And reading is important, right? Because reading leads to a good execution. Uh, reading helps you understand what's happening in the case study. What, what is the requirement? At, at times, the students are in so panic, they overlook the requirement. They, they, they fail to understand the requirement. Uh, try to understand the requirement. What is the objective of the requirement? And try to meet that in a perfect manner by reading through the case study and blending your answer with the case study as much as possible. So the total time management for question number one is 59, two and three, it's 39 each. Look at the reading and planning time in orange and look at the writing time in red. And that's how you can effectively plan your practice over the next three weeks in the same time management. So you can do exactly the same on the day of your real exam. Now, what is in section B? How you can excel in section B apart from time management? Let's take an overview of section B. 70% of the paper, three constructed response questions with one worth 30 and the other two worth 20 each. Focus on areas like corporate governance weaknesses, focus on areas like internal controls, substantive procedures, audit risk and responses, and audit report. We know section B is very standardized, it's very systematic. We know questions comes on internal control very regularly. Audit risk and response is regular. Audit report is regular. Sometimes you do see questions on weaknesses in corporate governance. Substantive procedure is almost mandatory. It comes in every single exam setting. If you are good in these five areas, you're good in corporate governance weaknesses, you're good in internal controls, you're good in audit report, you're good in substantive procedures, you're good in audit risk and responses, and if practice like five, six papers on each of these topics, you're excelling in your upcoming exams. These are repetitive areas and core areas for section B. And I'll just give you the, the key questions to practice in each of these areas. Knowledge testing is also part of section B. Areas like outsourcing, impact of outsourcing on audit planning, uh, using the work of an expert, using the work of internal auditor, matters to be included in the audit strategy. What sort of matters you include in an audit strategy? Benefits of an audit planning, quality management, uh, matters are the key areas which normally comes in knowledge testing for section B, four to six marks. Attempt recent five exam settings to be good at section B. I've, I've recommended you a total of nine papers, right? So when you're doing these nine papers, in each of these nine papers, you will get through the knowledge part. You will get areas like outsourcing or using the work of an expert, internal auditor, strategy, benefits. And you can just uh, be good on these areas because again, the chances of repetition is there, but still you get a dimension of how knowledge comes into the section B for four, six marks on almost every question. Review three latest examiner reports to evaluate the examiner feedbacks uh, uh, to be excel excellent in section B. I've recommended you three examiner reports, right? So if you're reading through those three exam reports, you can uh, improve your prospects of scoring more marks in section B. So to excel in section B, take command of the core areas, internal controls, risk reporting, substantive procedures, corporate governance weaknesses. Take command of the knowledge areas. If you practice the nine papers I've recommended you, you will excel in both uh, the core areas, the knowledge areas for section B. Let's just go look, look into the corporate governance area for section B. Students should be well versed with the requirement of corporate governance as uh, as detailed in the AA syllabus to identify weaknesses from the given case study. We know the question on corporate governance asks you to identify the weaknesses in the corporate governance and to give recommendations. So if you have a good knowledge about audit committees or NEDs about chairman, uh, the split of the chairman and CEO, you know the basic requirements of corporate governance, which is part of the AA syllabus, you will be able to identify the weaknesses and to give recommendations. Alternatively, attempting few questions around the same topic will give you the right exam confidence of handling question of corporate governance weaknesses and recommendations. So you should know your syllabus area for corporate governance 
you should know the, the the best practices of corporate governance so that you can identify the weaknesses within the case study and then you can give recommendations. You can practice few questions around weaknesses in corporate governance to excel in this area for your upcoming exams. The key question around corporate governance you can do, good question to practice uh, the skill of describing corporate governance deficiencies and making relevant recommendations include uh, a question named Dale and Company from the sample September, December 22 question paper. So the nine papers I've recommended you includes the September, December 22 question paper. So in the September, December 22 question paper, there's a question named Dele Company, and you can do it as a good practice for corporate governance. Moving on to the next topic from section B, internal control, such an important, such a regular topic, such a static topic in section B, and so, many, so much dimension of this topic when it comes to testing in section B. Let's look at the dimensions of this topic and some key questions. Section B, internal controls. Internal controls uh, comes from two perspectives uh, in your section B, the knowledge part and the case-oriented part. In the knowledge part, uh, examiner do ask you uh, components of internal controls. So you should be knowing them very well. You should know how to define them, explain them. Then objectives of a control system. At times the examiner asks you list four objectives of a sales system or list four objectives of a payroll system. So you should know them from the knowledge perspective. Then the case oriented questions, which is a regular feature for section B, weaknesses in internal controls, recommendations, key controls, direct controls, and test of controls. You should be familiar with these jargons, direct controls, what they are, key controls, what they are, recommendations, weaknesses, and test of controls. And you've practiced questions around key controls, direct controls, test of controls, weaknesses, and recommendations. So this is the, the diversity of this topic in section B, internal controls, and you should be good on each of the areas coming in front of your screen currently. And again, how you excel articles followed by practice of the past papers and then reading through the examiner reports about criticism examiner have on the questions around internal controls. Knowledge testing on internal controls. Questions in section B of the AA paper uh, around internal controls at times contains a four to six marks requirement on testing knowledge such as components of internal controls or objective of an internal control system like purchase, payroll or sales four to six marks of the total question worth, but you should gain them to pass the AA paper. Key questions to practice around knowledge areas for internal controls. It is imperative that the future candidates ensure that they devote adequate time to learning the knowledge areas of the syllabus as well as practicing good questions. Good examples of questions to practice around knowledge areas for internal controls are as follow. Dale Company again from the sample, December, December 22 question. Whitka Company from March, June 22 exams. Pomeran Company from the September, December 21 paper. And the Castle Courier Company from the March, June 21 question paper. So try to ensure you're looking at these papers for questions around knowledge of internal controls and trying to excel on that. And the fifth one is the Swift company from the September, December 20 paper. So you can gain good knowledge about what sort of knowledge question comes from an internal control if you practice these five question papers on your screen currently. So moving on, case questions on internal control. What sort of case specific questions you get on internal controls? Case specific questions around internal controls is a very regular feature of the double exams. Students who have done reasonable practice of past papers, again, nine past papers I've recommended you, you will be very good on case oriented testings of internal control. You know, questions are uh, around case comes on control weaknesses, identifying them, explaining uh, the weakness and recommendation and a test of control. Key controls and test of controls is another, another, another question. Direct controls and test of control is another question. So either the question focus on deficiencies, recommendations and test of control, or the question focus on the direct control with test of control and key control with test of control. And you should practice each one of them to excel. Deficiencies in internal control. Uh, and recommendations, list of key questions. 
Good questions to practice on deficiencies and internal control recommendations. Again, the Dali company from September, December 22. Again, the Witteka company from March, June 22. The Pomeranian company from September, December 21. Castle Courier again from March, June 21. And Snow Down company from March, June 20. So please ensure you do this, right? It is not in the list of the nine questions. But it's a very good question. So try to identify this question. It's not on the practice platform. So you need to get it from some other sources. But this March, June 20 paper is a really good one for your practice around internal control deficiencies and recommendations. So please take a screenshot when you're watching this video and try to note down these five questions to do on internal control deficiencies and recommendations. Direct controls. In order to be a direct control, candidate needs to consider whether the control as described has been appropriately designed and is being operated in such a way that it would be it, it would in fact prevent or detect a material misstatement. So a direct control in a case study is a control which is performing excellently. There is no problem with the control and the control is being operating in such a good manner that it, it is preventing and detecting a material misstatement. So this is a definition of a direct control. Therefore, when identifying a direct control, it is important that the control described in the case study is complete. So if you are reading a control and you believe this is a good control, it's a complete control and it's helping management to prevent and detect a, a material misstatement, then you will identify that as a direct control, explain why it is a direct control and how it's helping the management mitigating the material misstatement and then putting a test of control to test the direct control. For example, the fact that the staff each have a unique clock card, which they use to enter and exit the factory, is not in itself a direct control. Additional checks would need to be undertaken to ensure that the clock cards are being used correctly. To be effective as a direct control, the process of employee using their clock cards needs to be supervised by a security staff. So if the question says the staff clock in and clock out the cards and this process is being monitored and supervised, now that is an absolute direct control. But if the process says the cards are swiped in and out full stop, and it's not telling you about the supervision of that process, then that would not be a direct control because still there is a risk that the staff might enter the card of their friends uh, who are even absent from the work. So to be a direct control, it should be an absolute control uh, operating effectively and it is reducing the risk of fraud or misstatements in the financial statements. So that is is an example of direct control. I hope you can learn from that and pick better from the case studies you will be solving. Some candidates are under the misconception that each sentence in the scenario contains a direct control or a deficiency. This is not the case. The scenario will include information which describe the way in which the system operates, but not all of this information indicates a direct control or a deficiency. At times you believe every sentence, every full stop is a deficiency or every sentence, every full stop is a key control or a direct control. No, some of them will be. So examiner is putting the whole system, but not the whole system will fall into the definition of a direct control or a key control or a deficiency. You need to pick them out cleverly. I've just given you a thought process of direct control. I, ho I hope that will help you out. Some key questions around direct controls with test of controls. Again, the, the Whittaker company from March, June 22, Castle Courier company again from March, June 21, and a Swift company from September, December 2020 are good examples of questions you can do around direct controls and test of controls. Test of controls. The last part of the requirement is for candidates to describe the test of control for each direct control identified or for each key control identified or for each uh, we uh, weakness. We know test of control comes in so many dimensions. Uh, direct controls and test of controls. Key controls and test of controls. <clears throat> or weaknesses, recommendations, and test of control. So one mark per test of control, right? But what wrong the student do with test of control? A test which starts with check is unlikely to provide sufficient detail 
as to how exactly the auditor will test the control. Detail must be given on, a, on specifically what is being done to achieve a check. The word itself is not enough. This is not my wording. This is examiner report. Check alone is not a test. What are you checking? How are you checking? A lot of times the students start answering the question, check the good dispatch note, check uh, the sales invoice. How you checked? You inspected a sample of invoices or you inspected a sample of good receiving notes. You reviewed a sample of check. Review is a action. A test has to start with an action. Observe, reperform, inspect, review, inquire. It has to start with action. What is the auditor doing? So look at this word over here. Test. The st test has to start with an action, right? Without action, you're not writing a test. So actions of the auditor, review, inquire, discuss, observe, reperform. These are test. Check is not telling wh what has the auditor done. Has he discussed? Has he inquired? Has he reperformed? Has he observed? Check is a very vague word, right? Examiner is not liking that. Re read the bullet number two carefully. So check alone is not good. So please refrain from that when you are attempting your paper. Next third, in addition, it must be remembered that test of controls are procedures carried out by the auditor. Therefore, candidates need to ensure that they focus on what the auditor should do rather than recommendations for management. A lot of time when students are writing test of controls, they mistakenly write recommendations for management. What should the management do to rectify? No. Test. What will the auditor do to test that the controls are operating effectively? What test the auditor will do to ensure that the key controls or the direct controls are operating effectively? Test. So test has to start with an action as demonstrated in the bullet number two above. Again, this will help you out refining. This is the beauty of reading examiner reports because this is all taken from examiner reports. Definition of direct control was taken from examiner report. Now you can imagine how good it is to read the three latest examiner reports. In considering how to test the control, a useful starting point is to consider if there are any documents which can be inspected. So how to test a control? The very good point as per the examiner is if there are any documents which can be inspected as this is likely to provide strong evidence that the control is operating like sales invoices, good dispatch notes, uh, any evidence of a signature, any evidence of a review, any evidence of the ma management signing something, a document. So if there is something documentary and you review that or you inspect that, that is a much better control, test of control, sorry. However, when describing the test of control, it is important to clearly state what document is being inspected, like invoice, good dispatch note, good receiving note, like a, pay, like a payroll slip, and for what purpose? A lot of times the students say, review a sample of good dispatch note, but they're not telling why, for what reason, to confirm, to ensure. So uh, you need to start with an action but you also should have a purpose of that action. So if you say review a sample of good dispatch note to confirm what? Write the reason. So an action plus a purpose becomes a good test of control. For example, if the scenario contained a control where the age receivable report was reviewed and passed to a credit controller for chasing the overdue debts, in testing this control, an appropriate response would be that the age receivable reports are inspected. So you will inspect the age receivable report because it's a document. And in this case, that it is an evidence of a review by credit controller. So why are you inspecting the age receivable re re report as an evidence that the credit controller has chased the overdue debt? So there are some signatures, some remarks of the credit controller to ensure that the credit controller has indeed worked on the age receivable report. Because whenever the management works on a document, they scribble something, they sign something, they authorize something, right? So those sort of documentary evidences on, or those sort of tick marks, sorry, on the paper is uh, an evidence for the auditor. 
the last one for test of controls in addition test such as observe do not score as well as inspection or some inquiries where more reliable evidence sources are available uh, examiner would not be happy with observe so try to use observe for something like manual like inventory count you can observe the inventory count something being done manually physical security you can observe the physical security but apart from that wherever you see, believe there is a documentary evidence or you can ask something to the management. So examiner says inquiring the management or inspecting a document is far better than observing. But yes, in some cases like a physical security, observing is better. But if a student is very habitual of observing everything, examiner is not liking that because observation uh, is very limited to a certain manual process. But rest of the time, it's all about the documentary evidence. So look at the bullet number last and also compare this with the bullet number first, which tells you look at the documents first as a more important documentary evidence. So I hope this will refine your uh, knowledge around TOCs. Uh, again, this will encourage the habit of reading the examiner reports because see, they're so productive. So you can learn so much from exam reports. If you are still blur on TOCs, you're still blur on weaknesses, you're still blur on direct control. Examiner gives you definition of key controls. Examiner gives you definition of a direct control. Examiner even explains you when to use other meta paragraph, when to use emphasis of a meta paragraph, even in the examiner report criticism. You can learn so much. Okay, so I've already given you key questions for test of controls when I was discussing direct controls and uh, key controls and weaknesses in internal controls. So every question you do for direct control, key controls and weaknesses have an element of test of control, right? The other area which is very regular in section B is audit risk and responses. Very regular, almost in every single exam setting. Section B, audit risk and auditor responses. Risk are around the accounting issues. You should have sound accounting knowledge coming from the F3 and F7 paper. Your accounting knowledge, you've learned from F3 and F7. All the accounting standards from F3 and F7 are part of your F8 paper. And you should identify the risk around the accounting issues. Because if you're strong on the accounting areas, you can easily pick up what is wrong in the accounting treatment or what may go wrong in the accounting treatment. So sometimes it is what may go wrong in the accounting treatment and sometimes the wrong is very obvious or the wrong is very obvious given in the case study. Already something wrong done by the management, something like a wrong accounting treatment already done by the management. So you can pick up the risk that this is the wrong treatment. So thus something has been understated and overstated. Sound financial reporting knowledge is, an, is, some, is, is essential for attempting a question on audit risk and responses. Control related issues in the case. Yes, sometimes the weak controls also give rise to a risk of material misstatement. We know control risk is also part of your audit risk definition. Factors giving rise to detection risk. Yes, if it is a first year audit, then again, you need to be watchful of your detection risk. Uh, if the client operates in multiple locations, have multiple warehouses, that also increase the detection risk for the auditor. So you need to be careful about picking uh, factors resulting in detection risk or resulting in control risk. Most of the time in the question, what you have is the inherent risk, like the wrong accounting treatment. Start clearly, stating clearly, sorry, what is the risk and what is the impact on the financial statement? These are two important things which students miss when they're writing the risk answer. What is the risk? For example, um, there is a long-term loan for five years which you recently uh, obtained from a bank. Now, when you record a five-year loan in the financial statement, uh, there is a risk of classification. Uh, the four years will go into a non-current liability. One year will go into the current liability. Now, when you say that the management could classify the loan wrongly or the management can classify the loan as a non-current obligation rather than as a current obligation, so what is the risk? There is a risk of classification. See this terminology, classification. There is a risk of valuation. There is a risk of wrong recognition. There is a risk of wrong measurement. There is a risk of wrong disclosures. How many, how many types of risk can be there? There could be a risk of disclosure, wrong, right, wrong, inappropriate, no disclosure, wrong recognition, wrong measurement, wrong valuation, inappropriate valuation wrong classification, inappropriate classifications, risk, try to hit the risk in the answer. And then with that risk, 
with that wrong thing, what is the impact of the financial statement? Something being under or overstated? Impact. US understated, OS overstated. But if there is a wrong disclosure, if there is no disclosure, that will not result in the under and overstatement. That will result in financial statements are materially misstated. But yes, if some if something is wrongly valued, like inventory is wrongly valued, then inventory could be overstated. So if you're working on an account balance and you're working on the wrong classification or wrong recognition or wrong valuation of an account balance, then you can say under and over. But if you're working on disclosures, then you will say financial statements are materially misstated because for disclosures, you cannot, you cannot identify the under and over statements. So two things to be rewarded, risk, impact. I hope you're clear. If you're writing an answer for audit risk, which does not have a risk identified and the impact identified is scoring zero. Because for me, there is a 0 0.5 marks for risk and there is a 0 0.5 marks for impact. If these two things are available in your answer, you're getting one out of one. I hope you can watch my lecture carefully. I, I've given you examples of risk. I've given you examples of impact. Be focused on that to fetch marks. Audit response to mitigate the risk. That's the next requirement, right? The audit response to mitigate the risk should be clear in terms of what the auditor will do during the audit to mitigate the risk identified. So you're identifying the risk at the planning stage, right? And when you come to the audit, you will perform procedures to mitigate them. So at the planning stage, the auditor is thinking about the response. At the planning stage, the auditor is thinking about what response will I take when I come to the audit? So try to write a procedure. Response is a procedure of the auditor, right? Which the auditor will take when he comes to the audit to ensure that with this procedure, I mitigate the risk identified not management responses, auditor responses. Students mostly identify the situation in the case which gives rise to a risk. However, mostly fail to comment on the underlying risk and the impact on the financial statement, which I just spoke of on my last slide. The scenario will typically, typically contain more than the number of risk required. So if the examiner is asking you, evaluate eight risk, so there might be 10, 11. If the examiner is saying evaluate six, there might be eight, nine, more than what is required. So you try to choose the best one you can write on. So there will be more, and examiner is asking for six, five, eight. You need to focus on them and try to choose the strongest one. So it is important that students plan their time carefully and only attempt to list the required number of points. Also work on the risk which you are stronger at. Each risk is worth one mark and each response is worth one mark. Okay, uh, I'm not just going through it. Uh, I've just discussed these things on my preceding slides, how to go down identifying the risk and the impact and the importance of the financial reporting knowledge uh, in terms of the uh, AA paper, particularly when you're identify identifying the risk from the case study. Mostly students give recommendations to mitigate the risk not realizing the fact that the question is asking for the auditor response to risk, not management. Why this happened? When the examiner is saying auditor response to risk, why, why do the student give management responses? Audit risk and auditor responses, not audit risk and management responses. So please ensure you're giving auditor responses to how the auditor will mitigate the risk when he comes for the audit. So that is very, very important. And the, the response of the auditor is like a procedure of the auditor, which the auditor will perform when he comes to the audit. One mark per response. I hope this will refine read examiner reports because this is all coming out from the examiner report. The more you read exam reports, the more clear you will be on each and every section B topic. You can learn so much from examples, from good, from bad, weak student, strong student, and the topic will refine and open for you. Some key questions on risk you can practice. Magpie from December 22, S Company from June 22, Peach Company from December 21, Corley Appliances from June 21, Heart Company from December 20 are some of the key questions, five of them, and you will refine your knowledge. 
read the examiner reports to get the best perspective of the mistakes the student do around risk and you can excel in this topic. Substantive procedures, the second last topic, very regular of feature of section B, how to excel in this. Shorter cases around specific accounting issues. If you've seen the recent papers, you must have seen examiner breaking the substantive procedures into shorter cases like share capital, receivables, payables, or sales, giving you shorter cases and then asking you write five procedures or four procedures on the relevant area. So examiner is giving you a, a shorter cases around substantive procedures and asking you uh, explain the substantive procedures on revenue for marks, explain the substantive procedures on share capital for marks, something like that. Recommend procedures for each case, uh, like four to five marks. You need to see the number of marks to see how many procedures you write because one mark, one procedure. Involve yourself in case to write the good procedure because examiner is giving you a case of a share capital and then asking you explain the substantive procedures on share capital. So you need to involve in that case of share capital to get through the procedures. CASP is a good audit procedure worth one mark. And I will always use this mnemonic in my regular classes and my webinars students who are engaged with me, uh, a part of my paid courses, uh, or want to take webinars from me for the September exams, you will come through this web, through this mnemonic CASP. I'll just be explaining it shortly for my set of students who will be watching this session on the YouTube. CASP is a good audit procedure worth one mark. CASP, what is it? The substantive procedure should be case specific because there is a case given already, and then there is a requirement. So the one who involves in the case, the one who tries to identify what exactly is happening in the case and what will I do as an auditor? What sort of procedures will I be making on the share capital story given by the examiner? What sort of procedures will I be making on the receivable story given by the examiner? Not rote learn procedures from the book. Case specific. Involve yourself in case you will pass. C. A. Action. I was just explaining you action, right? Even the test of controls cannot start without action. A procedure has to start with action, recalculate, inquire, discuss, inspect, not check, not obtain. A lot of times students start writing a procedure, obtain. Obtain is not a, an action. Obtain is like you're getting something from the management. But what are you doing on that obtain? Uh, after obtaining something, what are you doing? Start a procedure with the doing of the auditor, with the action of the auditor. Action A. Purpose, sorry, source. S, subject matter. Discuss with whom? Management. Management becomes a subject matter source. Review what? Board minutes. Board minutes becomes a source purpose. Recalculate what? Depreciation expense. That becomes a subject matter source. So if you have a source or a subject matter, discuss with the management. Discuss with the finance director. Discuss with the human resource director. Subject matter. If you say discuss and you're not mentioning whom, you say review, you're not mentioning the document. You're saying recalculate, but what? You're missing the subject meta and you're losing marks. And finally, should have a purpose. Review the board minutes to confirm what? Discuss with management to confirm what? Re recalculate the depreciation expense to confirm what? A procedure without a purpose, without confirming, without ensuring is useless. So try to ensure you indulge into CASP. The more, the better for you to get good marks in AA paper. Key practice questions around procedures. Pacific from December 22, spinach from June 22, Denobe from December 21, perfect from June 21, and Segetari from December 20. Audit report, the last and the most important area you have in section B, a must area section syllabus area E of your syllabus and you have so many examiner articles on this which you can blend from the website. Section B audit report. Strong and clear audit report knowledge will help you solve a good question because a lot of times the student mix OMP other meta paragraph with EOMP they mix qualified with adverse and adverse with uh, disclaimer and they mix the knowledge and they go to, they go to the exam hall and then they spoil the whole reporting question. Sound knowledge, good knowledge, such an easy question where you score 10 out of 10. It is, it is an easier question if you are sound and clear with all aspects of reporting. So if you do the recent five papers, recent six papers, I've recommended you nine papers. If you do all the nine papers, 
you will be crystal clear on knowledge and you read three latest exam reports and you will learn so much from the examiner criticism to refine yourself up with what you need to do in a reporting question. Be clear with types of opinions. Be clear with when to use CAM, what is a CAM, what is included in CAM, EOMP, when to use EOMP, what situations give rise to EOMP, auditor responsibility for other information, what is another information paragraph, what is included in the other information paragraph, when to use the MURGC paragraph, what are conditions for MURGC paragraph, and other better paragraph. Broader testing of syllabus area E. It is important that candidates adequately prepare themselves for the question from the syllabus area E because it's not just reporting. Sometimes the question asks you going concern. Sometimes the question asks you subsequent event. And there is just a five marks requirement on the implication for report. So you should be good on going concern. There is an examiner article. You should be good on subsequent event. There is an examiner article. And then you should be good on the reporting implications as well. So a question from syllabus area E is not just report. It could be other aspects like going concern and subsequent events. Questions around subsequent events, going concerns are tested regularly. So be good on that. Let's see a list of key questions to practice. These are key questions on areas of report. Again, the newbie company from December 21, perfect company from June 21, Segatari company from December 20, and Encore from June 20. So I hope this session is giving you the key questions to practice. Number one, it's giving you uh, the mindset to start reading examiner reports. I hope with the examples I've taken from examiner reports, you will be encouraged to read through them. The nine recent papers I've recommended, three examiner reports I've recommended, something like 15 examiner articles and two videos I've recommended would all be helpful here with the key questions. I hope this session uh, would help you devise a strategy for the next 21 days ahead of your exams. Mock is available for September. You need to do it somewhere around 1st of September, but try first to complete your practice, reading exam reports, uh, ensuring you know the do's and don'ts from the exam report, and then do a good mock exam on the 1st or 2nd of September, ahead of your actual exams on the 5th of September. I wish you all the very best of luck. I hope the session would immensely help you, uh, the AA students. And uh, if you have any queries or questions, you can post under the video and I'll be answering them. Take good care of yourself. Study effectively. Goodbye. And Allah Hafiz, your tutor, Kashif Kamran, signing off from the AA exam tip session for the September 23 exams.